Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. We're uh, back to school again. Uh, this time, uh, not a very dense topic, but uh, quite non-intuitive. If you read my uh, speaker reviews, you see there's always a statement at the beginning that says all the listening tests are performed in mono. Many uh, people quickly uh, uh, dismiss the results then saying, what the hell is this guy doing? Who listens to speakers one at a time? And uh, therefore, everything he says must be wrong. He doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's not my idea. It builds on decades of research in this area that uh, demonstrates why mono listening is much more uh, useful and powerful in determining the fidelity of a speaker than stereo or multi-channel. So I thought I uh, covered the literature in this area. Um, it's the kind of information where... Uh, most audiophiles don't seem to be aware of at all. Uh, the information is, is not readily available to them. And so everybody just goes by the lay intuition that uh, it's all about, you know, two speakers and imaging and all these aspects. So let's go over that. And uh, uh, let me start with uh, where the research started uh, almost uh, 40 years ago, 1983, uh, 38 years ago. <clears throat> the research was... Uh, uh, performed by Dr. Floyd Toole when he was part of the uh, uh, doing research at National Research Council in Canada. The Canadian government had built this uh, research institute to help the uh, local industry in Canada, uh, you know, advance their knowledge and competitiveness in the world. And one area they had was audio research. And uh, that's where companies like Paradigm, Anthem, uh, PSB and others started, all Canadian companies. So Dr. F uh, Floyd Toole went there and uh, did a lot of uh, study of, of, you know, what uh, speaker people prefer and why. But also one of the things he did was that comparing uh, stereo versus uh, mono listening. Uh, clearly doing stereo testing is a lot more time consuming than doing mono testing, especially if you want to do a blind test where you want to switch speakers. Switching two speakers is much more difficult than switching just one speaker. So uh, he wanted to find out if, if uh, you know, what the difference was between the two. Um, the paper is, you know, being old, it's kind of hard to read, so I've just cut and pasted a few sections of it. Uh, I encourage you, if you want to read it, to uh, go and, and uh, download the pa paper from Audio Engineering Society, or you can get uh, Dr. F uh, Floyd Toole's uh, superb book, Sound Reproduction in Rooms, and he goes over all these things in there also. But anyway... I'm going to quickly summarize the key points of, of, the, present, of the paper. They had the uh, same uh, four speakers, but organized in two separate uh, rooms. One is that they were tested as, as uh, mono, one at a time, and they, they were not swapping them. They were just, you know, positioning very close together. So you had a slight angle error, but otherwise, you know, you could just switch between A, B, and C, and D. For stereo, they actually put them on two turntables, and they would rotate the turntables and get the two... Uh, uh, speakers to align, and then same listening tests would be performed. The paper goes through great lengths in the content they use. These were exceptionally well recorded uh, concert uh, recordings of different types with, with uh, you know, multiple mics and, and just the stereo mics, and you can read about that in the paper. So this was kind of content that you know, was designed for this kind of testing uh, for both uh, imaging testing and also tonality. I'll jump right to the conclusion of the paper because it's most important. Um, but before I do, they, it's always useful in these tests to have a control, which is uh, something that you know in advance to be lousy. They uh, have three speakers. All three of them were hardly, you know, well rated in previous testing research they had done. But they also picked this other speaker, DD, that had this really bad subjective and objective results. And I'm showing you the objective frequency response measurement on the right. Look at how it has this, you know, just basis up here goes up and then it takes a nosedive and then the rest of the level doesn't even match the uh, woofer in there. So clearly a uh, screwed up, uh, you know, two-way design of some sort and off axis terrible. So they had this terrible speaker. Um, when they tested in mono, the three speakers sort of ranked one, two, and three. You can see they're clustered together and confirmed that what they already knew, which is these speakers rated well. By the way, this is a quality from four to eight or nine in here. Vertically higher is the better. 
car is better. Um, and uh, look at speaker DD in, in mono testing, it indeed you know, finished a lot worse than these things. There's no question that the speaker that we knew in advance was bad, was bad. But look at what happens when we switch to stereo. Uh, first, the three speakers maintain their rankings. One, two, and three is essentially one, two, and three here. So whether we're testing a mono stereo didn't make a difference. The rankings were both, for all three were very positive and very high but also their separation was also more or less the same. There's some degree of error in all these tests. They're subjective after all. So don't, you know, micro-focus into this thing. But essentially, they're similar to each other. But look at what happened to speaker DD. All of a sudden, when they were testing stereo, the same listeners weren't so bothered by this crummy speaker, and they rated it much closer to the... Uh, um, the three much better designed speakers. So clearly the listeners were fooled by the stereo effect and the, what a speaker that should have been easy to rate as being terrible became much harder. So, uh, and the speakers were good, you know, stereo versus mono didn't make a difference. Speaker that was bad became more forgiven in, in this, uh, you know, stereo testing. Um, a lot of people say, well, that's frequency response, frequency response, not everything. How about stereo imaging? How can we measure stereo imaging? And I'm not going to get into how we can measure. There are a lot of factors involved there. But uh, this test actually went after that. And it's called spatial quality. Spatial means two-dimensional or three-dimensional beyond a point source. It's a technical term. You'll see me use it a lot. Instead of just saying stereo imaging, that which, you know, has, uh, you know, it's not as technically correct term. And uh, here they tested, again, uh, stereo versus mono. And this time they were asking them, in this column on the left is the sound quality. On the right, they were asking them, uh, what do you, how do you rate the spatial quality of, of, of the speaker? And uh, in mono, look at that. We got one, two, and then the third one is way the heck down here. So, and very nice separation between these three speakers. But look at when we look at the exact same three speakers in stereo, look at this, they're clustered right together and listeners could no longer determine the spatial quality of, of those speakers relevant, uh, relative to each other. Here everybody thinks if you put two speakers in a room, you'll be able to hear the imaging a lot better than if you do mono. Now you might be saying, what the hell is he talking about? What is mono imaging? There's absolutely imaging. And indeed, that was brought out in here that this speaker, the reason it was rated so low was that when listeners were listening blind, by the way, all these are blind listening with the curtain in front, they thought this speaker sounded like an artificial point source or like a, I call it clock radio or whatever. It's just that was not pleasing to them. Whereas uh, these other speakers, they have a softer halo and, and imaging around the speaker, it was not a point source, which does not sound like reality. You know, in real life, if you were listening to me, I'm not coming out of this one little point in my mouth. There is a halo of sound that I'm generating, even though I'm in mono. Listen to somebody speaking in a church. They don't sound like a little point source. There's an imaging, there's a halo around them. And, and uh, uh, so speakers most definitely have that. Why do they have that? Because they sound, they send sound to the walls, and that's a delayed sound, and it comes back and generates a halo around the speaker, and actually pulls the speaker's image, uh, uh, and that makes it sort of wider image, so it's not in one spot. So clearly, uh, we were able to determine that a lot better than a speaker that what wasn't very good at that and provided this artificial point source of sound was rated low in mono. But in stereo, it was, again, a crapshoot, both on fidelity, which I've already talked about on the left, and spatial quality. All the speakers were thought to be the same. Whereas you look in here, you can see the wide variation. One and two were good speakers, and the third one was not. And it's the same third one in here that didn't do well in imaging either. And, you know, everything's spaced out apart. And we have better discrimination of the fidelity of the speaker, both in tonal quality and imaging on this. Now, you might say, well, that's an old study. Well, 
<laughs> it was, but the same set of people that worked at NRC spread out through the universe of, of audio, uh, Dr. Floyd Toole and, and uh, Dr. Olive uh, landed at Harmon. Um, some of the others landed at Paradigm and, and PSB and so forth. And uh, while at Harmon, uh, they uh, did a lot of uh, studying of this also because, again, it's very time consuming to uh, uh, do testing in, in mono versus stereo. And uh, this paper was published um, years later, uh, 2008, and it wasn't directly a test of this in that the paper's overall thesis is about the a new kind of uh, room equalization that Harman was developing. And in the process, they also tested it to see how well it performed in uh, mono testing, stereo testing, and 5.1 multi-channel testing. Um, I'll show you this room that I've been at at Harman. This is a purpose-built room, uh, complies with IEC spec, which is a, what a standard listening room should be. There's a paper on this also at AES, if you want to read from Sean Olive, goes through all the details. But essentially, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it's a multi-channel system over here. You can see the speakers spread out in here, and they show the speeds and feeds of that. So what was the outcome there? So they were testing different algorithms for uh, room EQ. Uh, and comparing it to doing nothing. So no EQ means the speakers were playing as is with no, no change, uh, no equalization. Then they had uh, three different algorithms they were applying. One is based on predicted in-room response and in situ and direct. I won't get into one, what those are. Maybe one day I'll cover room, room equalization later uh, in the future. But for now, just know that, think of these as like three separate speakers or three different sound signatures because equalization changes the, the sound. And and uh, listeners were listening to all of these in multi-channel or in stereo or in mono. First, let's start with multi-channel, which is this sort of this uh, white box with an X towards it. Notice that all four methods were the same. So doing nothing was the same as doing something with this algorithm or this algorithm, or maybe a little bit better with this algorithm. But essentially, if you look at the error bars, Listeners said, eh, I don't know what this EQ is doing or not doing. And when you change the algorithm, it also sounded the same. And so in multi-channel, they couldn't tell the difference between them, even though the algorithms technically were very different. Then they switched to stereo, and that's this red line over here uh, with a little triangle on it. And look at what happened all of a sudden. All the algorithms did better than doing no EQ, which is this, this, this line over here. So all of a sudden, doing nothing is worse than doing something. Uh, so it's a gap develop. But look at what happens when you go to do a mono testing. So you're only testing one speaker. All of a sudden, wow, the listeners were like, yeah, baby. When you switch on the EQ, look at the sound quality improvement. We went all the way up to six from uh, down to uh, three scores. So massive improvement in this algorithm and similar improvement in, in both of these other schemes, although the first scheme was superior. So this clearly proved this is a controlled double blind testing and just played by the book in a room that's designed to be repeatable and, and verifiable. Papers have been written, peer reviewed, and you know read by millions of people. And that 100% was the outcome. So this confirms again, the study that was done years and years back, some 20 years before, an exact same con conclusion. Now, people say, well, maybe Harman does this because they don't, they can't do a multi-channel listening test and therefore uh, they decided to uh, do a, you know, mono is cheaper and easier to do. That's what they're doing, they're being lazy. Well, that's not the case because if you go read uh, other publications from Harman, you see that they're very proud of this room that they built <clears throat> called the Harman um, Multi-Channel Listening uh, room MLL, and uh, what that is, is that it's a room where you can set up a full surround system of two different sets of speakers, and it will shuffle all of them simultaneously, so you can listen to one set of speakers in multi-channel, and then by press of a button, a few seconds later, using these hydraulic lifts, uh, all these speakers go back and forth, and a new set is presented to you. And you can see a better shot of it over here, where you know the speakers are sitting here, and and they all shuffle and not. So Harman has this room, but they don't use it hardly anymore. Or if they use it, they use it for mono testing because it just 
the results aren't there. And so I've gone to Harman twice, and both times I've taken the double blind tests of speakers. And this is one time, the picture that I took when I was there. And it's a much smaller room, so much cheaper to build. And it only shuffles one speaker at a time. So this speaker right now is the Martin Logan that's in the front. There's BMW over there, and that's a JBL. And they shuffle in and out randomly, and a random piece of music plays, and you have a scoring sheet where you give it the score. And I tell you, when you're sitting there, the job is difficult as it is when you evaluate in speakers. It's not an easy job because it still takes three or four seconds for the speakers to change and then tonality completely changes. And you've got to judge and you've got to score these speakers. So everything we can do to simplify the job, we need to do. We don't want to make the job so difficult for a subjective evaluator, listener, where they're giving us, you know, mishmash, wishy-washy answers. We want to make it as simple as we can, and nothing does that more than that. I tell you, when I was sitting there listening blind, I had no idea what was behind there. They'd never even told us what the speakers were, and you'd hear the speakers. Like this Martin Logan had a massively different sound signature than all the others, and... Uh, you know, in that regard, the job was simpler. So what does it net out to? Look, this is not a new idea. If you, if you haven't heard about it, shame on you, <laughs> not on me or the researchers. This goes back, you know, 40 years, 38 years. Dr. Floyd Toole has been talking about this in forums, in articles, in interviews, in his book. That's been out almost eight to 10 years. It just, there's no excuse to not know about it. Now, admittedly, you all consume content from the same usual sources of, you know, typical, you know, reviewers, what have you, and our, your buddies that aren't exposed to the proper science, never seen these papers, and everything your gut will say, hey, look, you know, you got to do this testing in in, uh, in stereo or multi-channel, and so I can't blame you fully, but from here on, I will blame you. Because this research is ironclad, it's solid. I've done this testing, I've done mono versus stereo, and I'm telling you, mono is just a way to tell. You can hear the tonality, you can hear what is wrong with the speaker. Why is this the fact that you know stereo is not as good? Um, I have a theory, which is what I call beauty of, of, of stereo multi-channel. Um, Stereo obviously sounds a lot nicer than a mono speaker does. A multi-channel even more sounds are coming all the way around you. I think the moment we, we do that, the, um, the brain, it just gets so much enjoyment out of that spatial quality that it gets lost and can't focus on what's happening, number one. Number two, there's masking that's happening. So if you have a frequency response error in one speaker, but the second one is playing the other channel, it can ride on top of this one, and you can't tell the difference between you know two speakers as accurately because you're listening to a mix of speakers, and it homogenizes things. There are different locations in the room. So you don't want to do that. Uh, I used to lead engineering for broadcast video companies and we'd sell to the major networks and, and uh, post-production studios and others. And uh, if you look at the professional monitor, they always have a button that goes to black and white instead of color. And you, we brought our you know effects systems and others installed at the, at the major network, let's say ESPN or CNN or, or what have you, BBC. And the first thing they would do, put the picture in black and white and look for artifacts. Because in color, same effect happens. The color fools your eye, is pretty, is nice. But the resolution and, and the acuity of the eye is higher in black and white, so they would instantly turn off the color with a button on a broadcast monitor, and then they would find artifacts and issues. They're like, oh, what's this ring in here? What is, you know, what is timing wrong in here? Same thing here. Um, we go to mono because we want to turn off the beauty of, of stereo. Stereo is an effect produced in production of music, the two speakers have no communication with each other. It's not like they play differently because the other one was turned on also. And we don't want that. We want to know, is this speaker properly engineered? Does it produce the right fidelity? And then, yes, when you use it, you listen to two if you want. I've had at least one person online on, a, on Audio Science Review that actually did this. It went from stereo, and he had multiple speakers he was evaluating. And he switched to mono and came reported right back. He says, wow. It was a lot easier, model. 
And uh, it's amazing that, you know, I'm one of the few people who still does this. I mean, it's like hardly anybody outside of Harman seems to be doing this, you know, mono testing. It just amazes me. Uh, I go to shows and everybody's sitting there pontificating what the sound is, whether sound is good or bad, listening to two channels. Yeah, of course it's hard. So you kind of sit there and pontificate whether, you know, the system sounds good or not. Switch to mono. It's easier, it's cheaper, it's more convenient. In my case, I only get one speaker to ship back and forth to me. There's a lot of expense and a hassle involved in shipping two speakers back and forth for testing. By shipping one speaker, we save half the cost, half the storage, half the manhandling and setup and everything. So, of course, every other reviewer out there is doing stereo testing and he keeps talking about imaging and everything, which is function of the content. And by the way, also function of frequency response. And they're just lost in the woods. That's why they keep talking about this nebulous stuff that just does not matter. You know, we want to know if the speaker is high fidelity or is not high fidelity. They need to switch to mono. You can't keep putting your head in the sand saying, Oh, you know, I've got two ears, therefore I gotta to listen to two speakers. No, if you want, you can do a secondary test in stereo. Nobody's stopping you. But start with mono, properly evaluate the sound of a speaker, then go if you want to listen to two channels. Good luck. Because by the way, those two channels, they're room specific, what imaging they create. So half the time they're probably talking about the, you know, what's happening in their room versus what's happening, you know, with speaker alone. And that's what we want to do. Um, one key thing to remember is that, you know, when we use measurements, they're hundred percent accurate because they're measurements, right? And I don't mean in, in that they answer something, but they're objective, the machine measures something, you can measure and measure and measure, and we can just touch and feel that measurement and sell it. When we use human subjects, they're so variable. We want to turn them into instruments, really. That's what our use is. We want to turn them into soldiers of that just we could just stick in front of speakers, say spit out a one to ten number, say how good the speaker is. And we gotta help that human listener become more reliable. Training makes them more reliable, knowledge makes them more reliable, and mono listening for speaker makes that listener more reliable. They're now able to tell differences, even if they're not professionally trained. They have a better shot of hearing what the speaker does. And as I've explained, even though it's non-intuitive, you absolutely have imaging uh, with a single speaker. When you have one speaker reflects off the wall, it creates a mirror image on the other side, and the speaker actually, is, uh, I'll use the word smear, but it's smear in a good way, that is image shifts, it literally called uh, image shift of a speaker and becomes a wider thing. That's why for center speakers, you wanna have wide dispersion because then it can hit the sidewalls and stretch that center speaker to be the width of your TV or projection screen. You don't want that sound to come out of one little point in the middle of a screen because the action is on entire uh, uh, display itself. But that's for another topic. Um, but just know that these things are important. You know, the tonality of a single speaker is important and the things that we cover, there's a reason I do what I do. Don't go around, you know, especially a lot of them are just reading some, tonight somebody was calling me a hack because he said that he just test in mono. There we go, I've rested my case. Well, no, you're a hack if you haven't spent five seconds asking, you know, somebody that knows, hey, why is, uh, you know, why mono testing is better? Clearly I'm not a stupid idiot that woke up in the morning and said, I'm just going to start listening in mono when the world thinks it should be in stereo. There's a reason for it, and it happens to be fortuitous that we can do this testing in mono. It actually works better, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been proven. There's just no doubt about this. And, and uh, no speaker goes from bad in mono to great in stereo. It just hasn't happened. You know, the rankings that exist in mono also exist in stereo. We're just as listeners, or we're less picky on this thing. And by the way, that's why a lot of you aren't disgusted with speakers you own that I measure and I say they're no good. Because you're listening to them in stereo and you're much less critical in stereo. And if you listen to them in multi-channel, that's why Bose made a living selling these little acoustic tiny little crappy speakers because it was multi-channel and that multi-channel effect is just so captivating, you know, those 5.1 speaker setups that are usually, you know, bottom of the line designs and cost, but you set them up in a multi-channel system, they sound nice because the content steals the show and convinces you they sound good. 
But, you know, if you want to know what's a good speaker, you want to start with a, you know, proper analysis. And if you can't do it, uh, I'm doing it for you. Just don't go around saying, you know, the, the guy's an idiot doing uh, mono testing. I stand on the shoulders of pretty tall people in doing what I do. Okay, hopefully you uh, could follow this. Uh, again, these papers are available. I'll create a thread on Audio Science Review uh, website. If you want to come and discuss these things, I can code more from the papers and, and uh, you know prove this point for you. But this should be enough. Please don't question it. You're questioning the ABCs of proper controlled listening tests for speakers. How are you supposed to do that? Okay, see you in a future video. Bye-bye.